the topic of discussion over here will be the anatomy of the subclavian artery in this module we are going to discuss about the branches course and also the relevant clinical anatomy which is associated with the subclavian artery so we have two subclavian arteries one is on the left and another one is on the right so the two major arteries which are located in the thorax what we can see here that lie beneath the clavicles and once they pass the lateral border of the first rib they officially form the axillary arteries which means the subclavian artery ends as the axillary artery and the axillary artery begins from the terminal part of the subclavian artery so what we need to know here is the subclavian artery is the chief source of upper limb arterial supply how can we justify such statement as we already mentioned about its terminal portion right so the terminal portion of the subclavian artery known as the axillary artery supplies the axillary region and the axillary artery in turn forms the brachial artery at the lower border of the teres major muscle and the brachial arteries in turn forms the radial and ulnar arteries that supply the arm as well as the forearm and finally these radial as well as ulnar arteries gives rise to an extensive vascular supply to arm and forearm so here before discussing the course as well as the branches let's have a quick review regarding the development of the subclavian artery so here the right subclavian artery arises from the fourth aortic arch of the right dorsal aorta and the right seventh intersegmental artery and coming towards the left subclavian artery the left subclavian artery develops from the left seventh intersegmental artery so this is what you need to know about the development and coming towards the course of the artery in the course let us discuss about the right first later we go back to the left subclavian artery so the right subclavian artery originates from the brachiocephalic trunk we can see right this is the arch of aorta arch of aorta is giving off a brachiocephalic trunk over here can you see clearly yes it has a brachiocephalic trunk that is behind the upper border of the right sternoclavicular joint and this brachiocephalic trunk in turn gives off two important arteries called as the right subclavian artery and the right common carotid artery which is shooting up into the neck so after the formation of the right subclavian artery from the brachiocephalic trunk it courses upwards that is above the clavicle you have to see the course pretty carefully over here right runs upwards above the clavicle and then it runs posterior to the scalenus anterior muscle which is also called as anterior scalene muscle to reach the lateral border of the first rib to become an officially called as the axillary artery so this is the overall course of the artery when we specifically talk about the right subclavian artery which is arising from the brachiocephalic trunk now about the left subclavian artery the left subclavian artery in the majority of the individuals originate from the aortic arch independently after the brachiocephalic trunk and the left common carotid artery have branched off it arises below the left common carotid artery and ascends into the neck lateral to the medial border of the scalenus anterior muscle and crosses behind this muscle and then descends towards the lateral border of the first rib where it officially becomes the axillary artery this is what you need to know about the course of the right as well as left subclavian artery now let us discuss about the parts 
So let us take one of the subclavian artery into consideration when we are discussing about the parts here because it is pretty common for both right as well as left. So each of the subclavian arteries is made up of three parts. These three parts which are defined in relation to that of the anterior scalene muscle of the neck. Because this is the muscle which is dividing the artery actually into three parts, right? As we defined in relation to the anterior scalene muscle in the neck, the parts can be divided. So the tributaries to the neck as well as brain arising from three parts of the subclavian artery. So these are the parts we are going to discuss now in detail. So let us discuss about the first part of the subclavian artery. So as you see pretty clearly here, the first part of the subclavian artery is medial to the anterior scalene muscle. What is it? The first part of the subclavian artery is medial to the anterior scalene muscle. And what are the structures which are related to this part? We can see very clearly here. What are the structures you can visualize on the picture? The cervical pleura, the apex of the lung, lies posterior to this part along with a cervical sympathetic trunk what we can identify over here and what are the branches which are coming from this part of the artery we need to know. So the first part of the subclavian artery gives off an important branches called as vertebral artery and we can see the internal thoracic artery and a trunk which is giving off called as a thyro cervical trunk. So these are the three branches which are coming off from the first part of the subclavian artery. After the first part, let us discuss about the second part here. So this part of the subclavian artery lies exactly posterior to the anterior scalene muscle. So I will remove the muscle here. The muscle has been removed. Now you can visualize the second part of the subclavian artery, right? Which means this part of the artery lies exactly behind that is posterior to the anterior scalene muscle and this artery gives rise to the costo cervical trunk as it courses upwards. This is what you need to know about the second part and coming towards the third part which is also called as the last part of the subclavian artery which lies lateral to the scalenous anterior muscle. The first part is medial to the scalenous anterior muscle. The second part lies posterior to the scalenous anterior muscle. And the third part of the subclavian artery lies lateral to the anterior scalene muscle which is also called as the scalenous anterior and gives off an important branch called as dorsal scapular artery. So dorsal scapular artery is a branch of third part of the subclavian artery. So this part of the artery lies on the first rib and also the most superficial part of the subclavian artery. Why it is important because the pulsations of the artery can be felt by applying a deep pressure in the homoclavicular triangle. Here you can see the homoclavicular triangle where we can also see the third part of the subclavian artery. So by applying the pressure on the homoclavicular triangle, one can identify the pulsations of this artery. And what are the relations here? You can see the brachial plexus. So which part of the brachial plexus is related to this structure? We could clearly see the inferior trunk, right? So the inferior trunk of the brachial plexus lies directly posterior to this part of the subclavian artery. And other than the artery what we already mentioned about the dorsal scapular artery, the suprascapular artery may also arise from the third part. But however, in majority of the individuals, this branch arises from the first part of the subclavian artery as a branch of thyrocervical trunk but sometimes it may also arise from the third part. So this is what you need to know about 
all the three parts of the subclavian artery. Now we have to discuss about the clinical anatomy called as subclavian steel syndrome. So it is a condition in which the subclavian artery proximal to the origin of the vertebral artery narrows or becomes occluded usually due to atherosclerosis. So this blockage results in a lack of blood supply reaching to the ipsilateral arm through the subclavian artery which can lead to a reversal of the blood flow in the affected vertebral artery so that the blood from the contralateral side can flow through the circle of villus to supply the affected arm. So this condition is mostly asymptomatic but if symptoms occur they are mainly caused by ischemia of the affected arm and include limb pain, fatigue, paresthesia and cold skin. And when we talk about the neurological manifestations can be present such as dizziness or even syncope can be seen or the syncope may be rare in cases but usually occur in the presence of cerebrovascular lesions. Here the characteristic diagnostic sign what often asked in the exams is the discrepancy in the blood pressure between the arms which is greater than 15 millimeters of mercury. Because of the ipsilateral side of the subclavian artery is occluded maybe because of atherosclerosis the blood pressure in the ipsilateral arm is gradually decreases when compared to that of the contralateral side. So the pressure in the contralateral side is higher when compared to that of the affected side. So the discrepancy between these pressures will be approximately greater than 15 millimeters of mercury. This is the diagnostic sign to identify the subclavian steel syndrome. And what about the imaging? The imaging modality of choice here will be ultrasonography because it can identify a reversal of blood flow or atherosclerosis which actually confirms the diagnosis. And a procedure called as endovascular intervention or surgery are used mainly to treat the symptomatic subclavian steel syndrome cases. So by this we completed the anatomy of the subclavian artery.